Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and thank you, Pat, for the invitation to, to be here. Uh, most of the talks I give are to medical audiences, so I don't uh, often get to talk to an audience that's uh, mostly engineers and business people and entrepreneurs, so we'll see how this goes. Um, what I wanted to talk about is some of the work that I've done as the a faculty member at the University of Texas uh, Medical School in Galveston, where I'm the principal investigator for uh, a series of projects that are uh, being done under the FAA Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation and funding provided uh, uh, from the FAA. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is not the vehicles and the rocket engines and and so forth, but the, the warm pink squishy things that we're going to put inside of your vehicles, uh, those of us that are in the human race and want to go to space. Um, and in looking at the, the question that came up when I first started uh, talking to some of my colleagues about uh, uh, suborbital space flight and flying 500 people a year instead of 500 people in total history, is they looked at me and said, you must be crazy. Uh, those folks are old, they're sick, they, they can't go to space. And as Wayne pointed out, my, my passion is to figure out ways to say yes, rather than ways to, to say no, you can't do this. And at the time, um, there was really limited information on non-career astronauts. Uh, nobody in the world had put uh, somebody that was 60 or 70 or 80 years old inside a centrifuge and spun them up to 6G. Um, and uh, so we really didn't know what, uh, what the average human could, could do. So we had a lot of um, unknowns. We also uh, suspected that there were a lot of individuals who could purchase a ticket who would have some significant medical problems. And so it was unclear as to how individuals like that might do. Um, so we designed a, a set of experiments, and I'm going to talk about two projects that we really integrated into one. Uh, the first part of that is if we're going to do some evaluation of individuals under the G loads that a space flight would, would give them, we need a way to monitor them. And we need to be able to do that in a way that if it were to be used in space uh, during their, their space flight, it's very unobtrusive. Um, I don't know about you, but most of the folks that I've talked to who pay a lot of money to do a space flight don't want wires hanging out all over the place that get uh, tangled up. And so we uh, evaluated both some equipment as well as their ability to, uh, to do the flight. Um, <clears throat> the good news about the equipment is also the bad news. The technology is evolving so rapidly that we've, what we tested last year is, is old stuff. And so it's a continuing uh, race to keep up with what's the new and best uh, equipment to do the monitoring that we need and to avoid having pictures like this, um, which are the, the setup that we used to do the, uh, the research studies using the NASTAR centrifuge um, uh, just north of Philadelphia. We had some information to, to go on because uh, I was involved back in 2007 and 8 when Virgin Galactic um, took a, a, a number of their founders, the initial uh, individuals that had purchased tickets, and did some training using the NASTAR centrifuge. This was not a research study, it was a training uh, experience. But I was there uh, doing some of the monitoring and able to, uh, to track some of the data, and so after the fact, we did an analysis of, of, uh, of that data, um, and 77 individuals uh, fell in that category. Uh, we looked at their blood pressure and their heart rate and so forth, and generally found that they did uh, very well. But we needed to be able to demonstrate that we could take individuals with significant health problems in sufficient numbers to get data that said, yes, this is statistically significant, these folks can, can do a flight. So we looked at five different conditions in this. One was heart disease. We had people that had had heart attacks, had <clears throat> bypass surgery, stents, heart valve replacements, pacemakers, you name it. These were folks that had some significant heart disease. Folks with high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, folks that had, had lung problems, uh, difficulty breathing, and individuals that had had back or neck problems in the past. We recruited individuals um, nationwide. Most of them came from the 
a general Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York area because of uh, proximity. But these were just folks off the street. We had school teachers, retired individuals, students, uh, all kinds of, of folks. 86 individuals in total, as you can see there, with uh, ranging in age from 22 to 78, um, mean age about 46. And we monitored their blood pressure, their EKG, their heart rate, uh, their oxygen saturation in their blood. Um, we did balance exams after their spins on the centrifuge, in addition to questionnaires and, and so forth. Um, and um, uh, we're very pleased with the results. I can report to you that if you want to go to space, chances are very, very good that you can do that. Can everybody go? No. There are some individuals who have medical conditions that simply are not able to be improved or stabilized to the point that it would make a, a space flight safe, but the vast majority of individuals uh, will be able to do this. We also demonstrated that uh, there are strategies to help with things like people get nervous. I get nervous going into the centrifuge, and I've done it a bunch of times. My blood pressure goes up 20 points just thinking about getting in, and I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and so there are ways to deal with that, that nervousness about the flight. There are ways to train individuals to uh, uh, withstand the G-forces and do that successfully. Um, but we still have work to be done, and Pat asked me to finish up with a video that was humorous. So this is for you, Pat. And if any of you want to sign up for our next research study, uh, I would love to talk with you afterwards. So let's see how this goes. If you could run this video for me. This is a preview of our, of our next uh, research study here. So with that, I'll take volunteers for, for our next uh, study. Uh, the message I wanted to, to bring today is that uh, spaceflight is indeed open to the world. Um, it is going to be a lot of fun over the next couple of years as we start flying a, a lot of folks into, into space, give them the experience that only professional astronauts have had up till now. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to help people uh, make, uh, make their dreams come true. I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, thank you very much.